Hi everyone, um, welcome to lecture five. Uh, hope you're safe and well. Um, so today we're going to look at the post World War II economic order. So the, the Bretton Woods and um, Keynesian uh, systems. So, um, I should say the post World War II systems, right? Um, so, we're going to cover the Bretton Woods Conference, the Marshall Plan, Keynesianism, the Soviet alternative, and import substitution uh, as, a, as a third way. Um, uh, okay. So, the the US didn't have the uh, colonial empires that uh, many of the European countries had. And even though uh, they had made a lot of inroads during uh, during World War One, when the when they um, when they filled the vacuum left by uh, the European powers uh, and especially um, investment around the world. But with the uh, with the Great Depression, um, tariff barriers went up, uh, and uh, colonial powers were were really uh, were only allowed to trade with the motherland. Um, the the British Empire as uh, the the prototype uh, example, they had an imperial preference system uh, that raised very high tariffs uh, on most things and banned the sale or, or um, uh, buying of, of certain goods altogether unless it, it happened with, uh, with the motherland. So the US's primary goal uh, for after the war was dismantling these empires, right? these preference systems. And particularly uh, at the beginning of World War II, the, the British planners thought that things were going to go back to normal um, uh, geopolitically after the war. And, and so many thought that Britain would once again be their main rival. Right? So lots of lots of things obviously changed uh, over the course of the war, but so when when uh, FDR and uh, Churchill met on uh, a battleship in the in the middle of the Atlantic in uh, August 1941 to sign or to negotiate U.S. loans of material and weapons and money to the British uh, so they could fight the Nazis. And the US uh, wasn't in the war yet, right? Uh, the loans came with the condition that the imperial system would be dismantled, right? Uh, or at least the imperial preference system. So the US didn't really care about the empires, it's the lack of market access, right? But if you can't force your colonies to sell to you and no one else and to buy your stuff and no one else's, what's the point of having a colony, right? <laughs> so anyway, so the Atlantic Charter that the two leaders uh, signed during this meeting stated that the joint war aims So the the U.S. didn't have the colonial empires that the the some, many of the Europeans had, and so this was really damaging economically, because even though the U.S. had replaced the U.K. in terms of uh, um, financing investment around the world, uh, U.S. exports were still banned from a lot of um, of these empires, of, of these colonies. And especially once the Great Depression got going, 
uh, and the tariff tariffs were raised tariff walls were raised around these colonies so that uh, and the British uh, is a prime example where they had the imperial uh, preference system so uh, the trade between the colonies and the motherland uh, was either mandated um, or involved uh, zero tariffs while every you know trade with anyone else had you know 200 percent tariff right? effectively achieving the same thing so entering world war ii the us's primary goal uh, for after the war was the dismantling of these uh, imperial uh, empires or at least they might not have cared so much about the actual empires, but it's the the uh, market access, right? They wanted the same access as you know the motherland. They didn't want to have um, uh, have preferential systems. So, but if that's if that was going to be the case. Um, the, I mean, the whole point of having a colony is that you can force them to sell to the motherland cheap and to buy from the motherland, you know, more, uh, at a higher price, and you know, so in uh, so essentially control access. If if it's free trade, then there's no point in having a colony, right? So effectively, the same thing. So. When Roosevelt and Churchill met on a battleship in the, the middle of the Atlantic uh, in August 1941 um, to negotiate loans of material and weapons and um, money to the British so they could keep fighting the Nazis, the loans came with the condition that the imperial system would be dismantled. Uh, and so so the Atlantic Charter that the, the leaders signed uh, or, or agreed to in that meeting, uh, stating the war aims. It included the line, uh, and I quote, to further the enjoyment of all states of access on equal terms to the trade and to the raw materials of the world, uh, end quote. So the in implications of this was clear, uh, you know, no more empires, right? U.S. Secretary of State uh, Sumner Wells uh, exclaimed uh, that the age of imperialism is ended. Right? So that's the underlying current to the Atlantic Charter. The problem for the world, and especially for the Europeans, uh, the Japanese and the Soviets, was that even in good times, their economies needed many imports to function. Right? And all of Europe was was a bombed out disaster zone. <laughs> um, so, and many, so many places were bombed by both sides, right? So, for example, the, when the Germans invaded Poland, they bombed Belgrade and killed 17,000 people in one night, right? And then the Allies, once the Germans held it, uh, the Allies bombed it repeatedly, trying to kill the Germans, right? So um, places were literally just wiped off the, the map, right? Like they're just reduced to rubble and mud. Um, so, so Europe's destroyed, millions and millions are homeless and starving. Uh, their economies couldn't produce anything, right? Uh, you know, uh, how to produce anything, right? When you when you've been bombed back to the the Stone Age. So, uh, so for example, if the the problem was that if France wants to buy Brazilian uh, uh, wheat, right? The, a Brazilian farmer isn't going to accept a French uh, uh, franc, right? Because the, they, you can't buy anything in in Brazil with a French franc, right? So it's worthless to the Brazilian farmer. So, uh, and barter is so inefficient to the point of being impossible, especially on a large scale. Um, 
So the French have to pay in gold, right? Because gold is convertible to whatever the Brazilian wants, right? Brazilian, uh, I think it's reals or yeah, something. Anyway, it's to a Brazilian currency. So the French have to use gold, uh, and so do the British and the Italians and the Japanese and the Germans and everyone, right? Gold was the universal currency, right? It's the medium of exchange. But the problem was, was that the US had all the gold, like all the gold, um, like two, they've, they have financed two world wars, uh, so they literally have all the gold. Or eighty percent of the world's gold stock at the time was in Fort Knox. Right? So, so massive currency problem, right? Like not just not just the fact that um, you know Europe doesn't have any money, it can't buy anything in its own currency, right? And it wasn't just the Americans' gold reserves that had grown. Uh, the U.S. economy before World War II was uh, about half the size of the combined uh, economies of the U.K., Germany, Japan, and Russia. Right? So um, four big economies. The U.S. is uh, about half, which is fairly decent, right? After World War II, it was bigger than all of them combined. Uh, the carpet bombing done during World War II targeted the industries and cities of Europe and Japan. So the US was the only advanced uh, industrial economy left. And so the US was, a, is, was in an extremely commanding position. Um, and when, so when the representatives of uh, the 44 um, US allies gathered at Bretton Woods, uh, a resort in New Hampshire in the US, in July 1944. The US was there to tell them what the, the new international trading and financial system was going to be. Right? So op sometimes, op often in books, uh, they tell this, this story, this conference, as this negotiated treaty, and it was all very cooperative. and. Uh, but don't be don't be fooled, right? Like this was a hostage situation. Um, everyone's broke uh, and needed U.S. help, right? Needed needed U.S. money, um, and the whole world needed access to the U.S. market, right? The only market that really mattered anymore. So the the new system was designed to end the imperial power of Britain in particular. Uh, but all of the, the colonial powers. Um, so the thousand or so delegates, uh, you know, from 44 nations had the new system explained to them by uh, the US representative Harry Dexter White. And they listened and signed where he told them to sign. Right? Um, they needed US loans uh, and access to US markets. And they needed a unit of exchange to facilitate trade, right? So if that wasn't going to be gold, uh, it had to be something else. The new system was that the medium of exchange would no longer be gold, because no one had any, <laughs> but instead it would be the US dollar. All currencies would be fixed to the US dollar, and the dollar would then be fixed to gold to give it some sort of uh, foundation. So in essence, uh, the world's currency becomes uh, a gold-backed uh, U.S. dollar, and everyone's uh, everyone's domestic currency is convertible for U.S. dollars at a set fixed price, and uh, and the new organization, the uh, International Monetary Fund, the IMF, would decide when and if and to what extent. Uh, any changes to those fixed rates would be right. Uh, so there was a understanding that um, that uh, they've designed a system that had the stability of the gold standard, but not the inflexibility of it. Right. So that the IMF was supposed to be there to help boost uh, domestic economies 
uh, when needed. Right? But because it wasn't wasn't only up to the uh, the domestic governments themselves to decide what the fix is, it gave stability to the system. And the head of the IMF was obviously uh, a US official. And, uh, and so the US would have veto power on countries changing their exchange rates. And not only would this stop competitive devaluations uh, and hopefully hyperinflation, the, the benefit for the US was that or the benefit for fixing everyone's rates, right? Whereas now they're, they're criticizing, uh, say, China for fixing their rates, right? The reason why the US wanted a fixed rate system was that the pressures on the US dollar then was, was all to the upside, right? So they're... Um, their currency would only increase in value against everyone else's and it would make US uh, exports uncompetitive eventually. Right? So there's that sort of thing in the background as well. And the IMF would also have the other role of uh, making short-term loans to countries that ran short of US dollars and this would allow international trade to get going again. Right. So the IMF was going to loan money to short term, but loan money to all the European and, and Japan uh, countries uh, so that they could buy US goods right, and get trade going that way. And the another problem that that prior will there was another problem that prior to World War II, all international investment was done uh, in the form of private loans. And private investors were wary of the kind of investments that the Europeans really needed, right? So think so big scale projects that had very long term um, payoffs, right? So ports and roads and railways and airports and dams and you know all the things that have been bombed to bits right but if you don't have these as a society it it makes the function it makes everything else not function right but these large projects were too risky for uh for private investors because the the payoff was such a long term right so to solve this problem, another new organisation was uh, created called the World Bank, or the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development is actually its, its proper name. And so this bank would borrow uh, borrow money from private investors right, and do this really cheaply because the returns would be guaranteed by governments and the US government pretty well. And But then the World Bank would then lend it to European businessmen trying to build a bridge or a port or something. Right? So, uh, you know, a, an elegant solution. Another part of the plan was that governments would be expected to ban short-term capital flows. Um, you'll recall, hopefully recall from the previous lecture that the that US dollars um, uh, or US investment being pulled out of uh, the world's economy and back to the US at, uh, turned slight downturns into massive long-term Great Recession, right? So uh, the architects of the plan wanted to stop that kind of speculative hot money flowing quickly and wrecking uh, economies, right? Making uh, creating currency crises, uh, crises, and uh, so short-term uh, money movements, capital flows were banned, uh, but long-term investments and loans were okay, but short-term moves were, were not allowed. So you couldn't speculate on on foreign on currencies appreciating or depreciating. <laughs>
So capital was not free to move except in the except in the form of long-term investments and and uh, investments that the government wanted and the kind that couldn't be quickly withdrawn in a downturn or a panic, right, causing a currency depreciation problem. So, the US's plan during World War II and planning for afterwards uh, was to break apart the British imperial tariff barriers, uh, continue the alliance with the Soviet Union, defang Germany by deindustrializing it and keeping it that way and breaking it up uh, and using IMF loans or short-term loans to countries to, in US dollars to kickstart international trade. So the British imperial trade system was ended, right? Uh, but the other parts of this plan quickly changed. The Soviets didn't withdraw from Europe, and instead of an alliance, uh, communism becomes the next uh, uh, existential threat. Uh, and because of this, the US suddenly needs a rebuilt and maybe even a rearmed Germany uh, to help stop the Soviets taking over uh, the rest of Europe, right? Um, and needs a Western Europe really quickly rebuilt. So, uh, instead of the gradual rebuilding that was envisioned with the, the, the reasonably short term and, and small loans from the IMF, Europe needs to be rebuilt fast in order to stop the communists either either being elected, right, because people are starving and they want, um, you know, uh, they want to be looked after, or, or or a revolution or a Soviet invasion. So the US mothballs uh, the IMF and the World Bank and takes the much more direct route of just giving money. Uh, so giving aid, right? So it's not a loan, it's just a gift. Um, President Truman, uh, so FDR had died um, by this time, but uh, so President Truman announced the Truman Plan, which uh, which committed the US to resisting the advance of communism anywhere and everywhere. Right? It's the start of the Cold War. And he did this in March 1947 in a speech designed to scare the hell out of uh, Congress so that, the, so that he could get the Marshall Plan funding through. Right? Uh, um, you know, Short-term loans is a very different thing to uh, massive amounts of just giving giving uh, giving money away. So the U.S. ends up giving about 13 and a half billion to Europe to rebuild them as useful allies in the Cold War fight against the spread of communism. And this alliance was made formal uh, with the formation of the North Atlantic uh, Treaty Organization or NATO, the military. Um, Alliance in early 1949. So the World Bank's role of encouraging investment in big projects is made irrelevant by the Marshall Plan. Uh, whereas before the end of World War II, the Americans had thought the British uh, was going to. They were. It was. It was just assumed that they would return to being the the principal U.S. rival, right? Uh, and the IMF could stop them devaluing to get an advantage. That role was also, uh, so the IMF's role in vetoing um, exchange rate uh, moves, that role was also mothballed as the needs of the Western allies to boost their economies as they saw fit took president, uh, precedence in the face of this Soviet threat. So, uh, for example, the UK briefly um, uh, made their currency convertible, but then um, uh, everyone come and, came and asked them for uh, to exchange um, sterling for, go for gold and dollars, and so their uh, foreign currency uh, reserves were quickly drained. So they fixed it, and they, they fixed it at a uh, devalue rate 
from previous, um, so devalued it by 30% in September 1949. And the UK simply informed the IMF after. Um, so the IMS role was, um, both of these organisations were really mothballed for 15 years, right? More. So the Cold War had begun and changed the US plans uh, somewhat. Another thing that evolved differently to what was envisioned was the International Trade Organization, or the ITO. Uh, a trade treaty aimed at lowering tariffs was signed by 23 countries in uh, October 1947. And this was, this was the uh, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, uh, or the GATT. And that this was supposed to be just an interim measure until the International Trade Organization Treaty superseded it. But unfortunately, the, um, the US Congress uh, refused to ratify uh, that. So the GATT remained the only sort of universal trade agreement. And it, it it's still at the heart of the, the WTO. And it, uh, so it, it was the only thing that was being used it was it was the only thing that was in place uh, for countries and the US in particular to liberalize trade by reducing tariffs so the gap was only superseded by uh, in 1995 by the World Trade Organization right? uh, so the heart of the GATT and now the WTO uh, is the most favored nation rule so this rule meant that whatever the lowest tariff rate was on any particular product, right? Say, say bananas have a have a imports of bananas have a 10% tariff on them into Australia, then Australia would have to give 10% to everyone. It couldn't say, okay, I'm going to organise. Uh, uh, me and Brazil are going to cut a deal. 10% um, I'll give you a special preference uh, um, you know, uh, tariff, 10% on bananas. If you give me 10% on, on them, sheep, right? Those sort, if those sort of deals were able to be made, but then Australia would have to give 10% to everyone, right? So it's you give whatever your most favoured nation tariff is on any particular product, you have to give it to everyone who is a member of the GATT or a member of the WTO. So, so there was no preferential treatment given to any country. Right? Everyone got the same, most favoured na uh, nation level of, of tariff. Though, very importantly, that doesn't mean that everyone had the same tariff rates, right? which will be important la in later lectures when I talk about the rise of China in particular. Um, but the gap meant no one got special deals, right? So whatever tariff you gave to one country on one product was the same tariff you, that everybody got for that product. So uh, specifically aimed at uh, stopping imperial tariff blocks. Right? Another key part of the, the international political economy sort of going forward from uh, from the end of World War II to, to 1970 ish was uh, was the wholesale adoption of interventionist government policies that that uh, came to be known as Keynesianism after its most famous uh, proponent John Maynard Keynes. Uh, he was an English economist, um, really the first celebrity economist. We've got a few now, but uh, he was really the first. And he died not long after Bretton Woods, uh, the Bretton Woods Conference. But his ideas about the harmfulness of the gold standard, uh, the need for government to spend to counter uh, downturns in the economy were extremely influential at the end of the, the Great Depression. And the idea of counter-cyclical government spending became uh, orthodox economic theory from the end of the Great Depression uh, all the way through to the late 1960s. Um, 
So classical economics, classical liberal laissez-faire economics uh, believed that you couldn't have extended periods of high unemployment because wages would fall and then capitalists or businesses would start hiring them again uh, because their wages had fallen so low and the, the employment market would clear, right? And full employment would uh, quickly be restored or something close to it. But obviously the Great Depression uh, proved this wrong. And Keynes argued that not only were wages and prices sticky now, but because of, because of uh, so wages and prices were sticky because of uh, oligopoly businesses, right? Uh, that could that um, that could set prices rather than be price takers, and unions, right? Who resisted uh, um, uh, wage declines. But also that the economy could get stuck at high unemployment because you had a vicious circle of because uh, because demand collapses, uh, investors or capitalists don't want to invest because no one's got any money. But unless investors invest and give people jobs so they've got money to buy things, then there is no demand, right? And you get stuck in this... Uh, um, uh, below full employment um, equilibrium. Keynesian economics uh, also advocated so, so Keynesian economics advocates that when demand collapses like that the government has to spend and not to spend but put people like hire people right? Um, build bridges, build dams, build you know um, and and it also advocates for unemployment insurance in a way as a way of maintaining demand in an economy, um, though the the government directly hiring to create wealth and demand so that the market could recover and full employment regained was much more of a focus. But um, so this was the Western Western democracy's answer to the problems of uh, classical laissez-faire uh, capitalism right? that had seen, had proven that it sort of, you, you had to crush the worker, right? Pri you know, wages and, uh, had to fall. Um, and so the, the cushioning of the economy in classical uh, economics Sort of really it was really the working class, right? Um, and so this was this was Western democracy's answer to that problem, right? If you have a welfare state uh, and countercyclical uh, management of the the economy, you can increase the welfare of uh, the working class and normal people, um, and still have the dynamism and and the the trade that that happens with um, being open to international trade. And the system seemed to work, right? Um, in fact, from the period, so from 1950 to, uh, to 1971, that, that period's often uh, called the, the golden age of economic growth. Uh, so in Western Europe and the US, Japan, the growth the growth was exceptional, right? and oil was cheap, and unemployment was low. Uh, the European Coal and Steel Community uh, Treaty is signed in 1951. It's them signing down the bottom there, uh, and that pulled the coal and ore deposits of both uh, France and Germany under an independent agency. And so that was that was designed to stop secret rearmament. Um, by either of the, the powers. And uh, so it took control of the nation's um, coal and oil, coal and ore out of the hands of the government, right? Uh, as a way of stopping the security dilemma 
of not knowing what the other was doing with their um, with their steel production, right? Were they making skyscrapers or were they making tanks, right? So this independent agency depoliticized that, um, and it and that treaty uh, is the start of the the European Union, right? So with generous welfare systems and Keynesian economics managing the domestic economies and the Bretton Woods system managing the international trade, the Western democracies argued that they had solved the dilemmas of capitalism in a way that improved the welfare of the ordinary citizen. But the Soviets had a very different answer. Now, firstly, I... I I feel like I need to point out that the Soviets won World War Two, right? They saved the world from the Nazis. They, they're the ones who beat the Nazis, not the Americans or the British. Um, in fact, in the critical period between when Germany invades uh, Russia in 1941 and the Allied landings in France in June 1944, 93% of all German casualties are, are on the Eastern Front fighting the Russians, right, or the Soviets. So the, the Soviets just threw men um, at gunpoint, right, like their officers were um, threatening them with death uh, unless they, you know, ran at, ran at, the, at the, um, the German war machine, a, a war machine that was much more advanced, right, uh, technologically better, better trained, better organised, um, Stalin had killed off uh, uh, all of his generals in a purge just prior to uh, World War Two, so that was um, that was not helpful. <laughs> so they just threw men at this war machine until it choked and died. And so new estimates put the number of deaths in the Soviet Union as high as 27 million. And Soviet military deaths, right, so deaths for soldiers, were more than the rest of the combatants in the war, um, Allied and Axis, put together. <laughs> so only China had more civilian deaths, and as a percentage of the population, Russia's uh, losses were still much higher. Right? We, often, we often hear about the, the lost generation uh, in the UK, uh, you know, all their... Uh, all their young men died in bomber raids, right? Um, but their their losses as a percentage of the population, and in total, but as a percentage of the population, are uh, you know pale into insig pale into pale in comparison to to the Soviet Union, who you know just uh, um, devastation, right? So they had a, a, a lot of rebuilding to do. And um, so it's kind of understandable that they weren't in a hurry to relinquish uh, control of the countries that they had retaken from the Nazis uh, without installing um, uh, governments that were aligned with their interests. Right? Uh, after, you know, after the horrific price they'd paid. Right? So the Soviets schooled their new allies on Soviet-style so central planning and encouraged them to follow the Soviet-style path to autonomous industry-led economic development. The new members of this Soviet bloc and the Soviet Union itself uh, rebuilt from the war damage amazingly quickly. Right? Uh, by 1950, the Soviet industrial production was nearly double that of 1945. Right? So they're not just recovered, but doubled. Uh, and so well above pre-war levels. And living standards also seem to be rising. Um, by 1949, the industrial output of every other country in the Soviet bloc surpassed pre-war levels. And this is a remarkable performance, um, and it was really important at the time because 
It was giving countries, other countries, an alternative to the welfare state capitalism of the West. A capitalism that had seemed to run the world into two world wars and you know, devastate the planet. And communism was spreading beyond Europe, right? The, the communists had won the civil war in China uh, and communist governments controlled uh, both North Korea and North Vietnam. Um, and as the British Empire uh, dissolved uh, and the other empires dissolved, so uh, you have this, these waves of um, uh, decolonization. Right. And so the the Cold War struggle, this this um, uh, the alternative paths to development, right, rebuilding and development, presented by the the capitalist West and the and the um, uh, communist East, right, being presented to the world. That's the ideological argument, right, and that's that goes global. Uh, so under laissez-faire capitalism, the ruling classes had little concern for reducing poverty and in many ways thought it was desirable as a way of maintaining low wages and international competitiveness. Right? Um, the classical liberal view was that you could not have international trade without periodically crushing the working class to restore economic balance. Right? You had to... Uh, make a whole lot of them unemployed and, and reduce the wages of the rest. Um, they were the, the shock absorber. And openness and being concerned with the welfare of the working class was not compatible in liberal uh, economic understanding. So the fascists had rejected this and pursued a nationalist uh, capitalist autarky, right? So they didn't bother being open to the world. They um, uh, they still crushed the crushed labor, right? Uh, but and and extracted all the wealth they could out of them. Um, but they chose an autarkic, uh, uh, closed to international trade system. So, but after the defeat of the fascists, both the Soviets and the West agreed that liberalism and fascism were both wrong, as they resulted in terrible outcomes for the working class. But the solution they gave was completely different. Right? The, the West aimed to prove that by building a welfare state, you could have a, still have a capitalist economy that was open to international trade while improving the situation of the working class and the poor. Whereas the communists argued the opposite, that improving the lot of the working class required rejecting markets altogether, both internationally and domestically. Right? and replacing them with central planning. And this was the economic um, argument of the Cold War, central planning versus uh, welfare state capitalism. And in the early decades of the war, it really looked like central planning was going to win. Um, another huge shift uh, in the politics and economics of the world uh, after, the, after World War II was the amazingly swift decolonization that happened. Um, so by 1965, all the former colonies had their independence. Um, though fascist uh, Portuguese government held on uh, to East Timor until 1975 and Macau in China uh, till 1999. But other than that, the rest happened in three waves that were all finished by 1965. And so these new governments looked to develop their economies, but most needed to import so much, right? Their, their rural economies, um, and so they were importing all their manufactured goods and, and etc. So, so they really imported everything except agricultural products and, and, and maybe some natural resources. So almost without exception, they all they all embarked in practice on what is now called import substitution as a way of de developing uh, domestic industries. And this really came out of um, uh, um, Latin America, 
right, that had been um, uh, independent for you know 100 years, and the economists there were quite um, instrumental in in instructing these new colonies, uh, sorry, new countries, uh, on what they should do to develop and industrialize. Import substitution industrialization, or ISI, is based on three theories uh, uh, that these theories give it a intellectual foundation, right? a justification. So that's uh, structuralism, the singer prebrish theory, and infant industry protection. And all have the assumption that um, a heavy concentration on agriculture results in poverty and that higher living standards can only be achieved through industrialization. Right. So the structural theory argues that developing, developing economies are too inflexible to allow resources to shift to manufacturing due to two coordination problems. Right. The complementary demand problem so this is uh, the idea that a new business has no one to sell to unless there are lots of new businesses starting simultaneously to create jobs that pay cash, right? So these, these governments are trying to move their people off the farm where they're living um, in, a, in a cashless society, basically. How do you create a business that needs customers that have cash if everyone just lives on farms growing their own food? making their own clothes. So, complementary demand problem had to be overcome. And the second problem was uh, pecuniary external economies problem. So this is, this is a coordination problem between, um, between different industries. So for example, cars and steel, right? Cars and steel could both lower prices and increase production if they could coordinate between them. Right. Um, uh, if the car owner could get cheaper steel uh, and the steel owner could get uh, bigger sales, they could both benefit as long as they could both trust each other to, for that to happen. So both these problems uh, in this uh, Latin American kind of style uh, uh, economic theory, the idea was that both these problems had to be overcome by a big push by government. The second um, foundation for uh, import substitution industrialization is the singer prebrish theory. And so here they, they argue that the, the price of primary commodities, right, uh, so uh, farm and agricultural um, goods, the pro uh, their price declines relative to the price of manufactured goods over the long term, which causes the terms of trade of primary product-based economies to deteriorate. So here you, you see uh, something that um, is income elastic, uh, the first graph on the left here. The, the more money you have, so your income increasing down the bottom, right? The, the higher the quality um, and more of something you demand, right? So the more money you have, the more uh, cars you might buy, right? Whereas uh, agriculture, the, the graph in the middle, is income inelastic, where no matter what your income gets to, the more income you generate, the curve starts flattening off. So the qu quantity of of the agricultural goods uh, hits a limit, hits a ceiling. <coughs> so no matter how uh, um, rich you get, there's only so much um, you know, flour you're gonna buy, right? Or bread you're gonna buy. Uh, so the, the relative, um, the relative price of uh, things um, 
puts agricultural producers behind, right? So the the worst case for agricultural or oil or natural products is that you might have uh, negative income elasticity where the higher income you have, the less you buy of something, right? So you stop buying so much rice and you start buying more meat or, uh, you know, um, or the richer you get, the the you stop buying so much oil and you buy a, a Tesla, right? Those sort of things. So the idea behind a singer Prebish theory is that the responsi responsiveness of the quantity demanded for a good or service changes uh, by how much income you have. And in particular, manufactured goods, the demand for it goes up with income, whereas for agricultural uh, goods, the, the demand for them falls uh, uh, as income rises, or at least flatten, it flattens off. So this is a justification for, hey, we've got to get out of agriculture and get into manufactured goods. The third theory that uh, underpins or justifies uh, import substitution is the infant industry protection idea. And so this is, um, this is the idea that industries that have large economies of scale, and that tends to be manufactured goods, right? It's very, it's, if you are, if you make one, uh, um, if you make one car by hand, right, uh, you're going to have to sell it for a hell of a lot of money. But if you if you make um, uh, you know one million cars, you your profit margin can be much much less. Right? So there's economies of scale for many manufactured goods. Right? So by definition, it a company is going to be uncompetitive until they achieve a large enough size and scale if they are trying to uh, um, operate in those sort of markets. Right? So this means that countries couldn't open themselves up to international competition because their infant industries would be wiped out. So the idea was that subsidies and tariff barriers were needed to protect in infant industries until they were big enough to compete internationally. Right? Um, so Australia followed this uh, um, this idea as well, uh, as did m many of the middle tier and certainly all the developing countries. So easy what I'm calling easy uh, import substitution, right? uh, based on the seemingly successful uh, sort of central planning of, um, of the Soviet Union, plus the structuralism and the singer Prebish theory and the idea of protecting your uh, infant industries, right? Um, but easy import substitution industrialization is at the start, right? But then you're going to face a, a, a choice further down the line. Do you double down and continue with uh, replacing imports? So secondary import substitution industrialization, or you can move to an export orientated strategy, which is what the East Asian Tigers did. So easy import substitution industrialization. Uh, so here the focus was on relatively simple goods selling to the domestic market. So high tariffs and a currency fixed uh, so that it's actually overvalued, right? So this, uh, this helps domestic producers because buying imports for their industries are much cheaper if your currency is overvalued, right? But it kills any exports. But these countries don't care about that. They're, they're trying to develop uh, domestic uh, industries. 
So, for example, India's um, export, export um, as a percentage of their GDP, it fell to less than 2%, right? So that's a, that's, that's a country that doesn't export anything, right? Um, and so the focus was on these relatively um, simple products because they were low risk, right? Uh, so there's a, there was a large domestic demand because you're blocking uh, any imports, right? You've either banned them or, you know, you've got a, a, um, a quota or, or a massive tariff. Plus they're mature products, so equipment, fact, factory equipment to make them is, is easily purchased from overseas. Uh, and with your high currency, those machines are cheap. And they use low-skilled low labour. So the shift from uh, agriculture uh, into wage-based work could happen without large investments in uh, education and lifting skill levels, right? Uh, so it could happen really quickly, right? People didn't need a university degree, right? So the aim was to increase wage-based labour solve unemployment and gradually develop skills and all of which worked really well uh, initially but the gains from this strategy eventually reached its reached its limit so then you've got two options right you you continue substituting more complex imports so called secondary um, isi or uh, the so for um, the Asian tigers, so four countries, uh, Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and South Korea, that in the mid 1960s, they switched to uh, an export oriented uh, strategy. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So secondary import substitution industrialization. Uh, the aim was to industrialize by the government borrowing money and starting, you know, car factories or whatever, right? And so more complex um, goods, replacing imports and selling only to the domestic market. <coughs> so high level of government owned enterprises, right? So state owned enterprises are everywhere and high tariffs close the economy to protect these infant industries. Right? So, um, just as an example, this is a um, this is a table of the the average uh, tariff level in Latin America around 1960, right? So, as a percentage, you can see Argentina 176% on on non-durable consumer goods, right? Uh, Brazil 260, Chile 328, right? Like that's so if you wanted to sell into that um, into that market, 328% you would have to add to your price, right? So that gives a domestic producer a hell of a lot of room to move, right? And and be more competitive, you know, than you. But autarky is extremely inefficient. Um, and it actually makes everyone poorer, except uh, the people benefiting, uh, except the domestic producers. Right? So, uh, second ISI worked really well through the 1960s and 70s and produced rapid economic growth in the uh, decolonized world. Uh, but it had very large costs to the rest of the economy. And the rest of the economy really was just agriculture, right? But agriculture was taxed up to 60% by most governments by setting up a monop monopoly uh, agricultural marketing boards, right? That as a farmer, you, you had to sell your produce to the, the marketing board. And that marketing board would only pay you, say, 40% percent of the the world market price and then sell it to the world um, at uh, at higher prices right and keep the difference and then that 
that money would then be put into the state-owned enterprises to you know in loans or subsidies or etc right so the whole the whole economy is extracting money out of agriculture the only thing that these countries you know really had uh originally um uh all the money is getting extracted out of these out of this agriculture plus the 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 infant industries were were being protected by massive tariffs from outside competition. So, so it became clear that they had no incentive to actually improve their products or reduce costs or, or reduce prices. So every niche in the economy became filled with companies that produced crappy products that were overpriced and they were getting taxpayer subsidies and tax breaks in order to do it, right? Plus, the money that the state is taking out of the farmers' pockets mean there's there's no investment in agriculture, right? So there's no there's no investment that might make that more uh, productive. So tractors and fertilizer, etc., right? So it really uh, um, stagnates the agriculture uh, economy as well. So because it is autarkic, right? So it's it's a closed economy, really. Import substitution strategy is not open free trading welfare state capitalism um, at all, right? Uh, but it is still using markets, um, even if the government is in, in there, right? It's still a market orientated system, right? Uh, money uh, pr prices can move and supply and demand is, is, op is operating, um, even if the government is uh, producing things, right? So that means they're not they're not actually central planning socialism of the Soviet Union either, right? It's really a third way, like a, it's a it's a um, mixture of both. But despite rapid growth in industry, obviously, right? Like, why would you stay a farmer? You go open a factory and get a subsidy and um, uh, sell something crappy, right? Uh, so massive growth in industry and, in, and employment in industry. Uh, but the inefficiencies and the perverse incentives of import substitution led to some really bad outcomes. And even Australia followed this strategy quite a bit too, right? Uh, we protected our car industry uh, and and most things, right? Like in the, in the 70s, uh, okay. so in the 70s, in Australia, it, people couldn't afford to buy um, uh, a, buy kids' clothing, right? Because it was these these protected industries, right? These domestic uh, manufacturers hiding behind tariff barriers, and so like kids' clothing was just astronomically expensive, right? Or nappies and things like that, right? So um, some bad outcomes, right? But in the 1980s, there's a whole series of debt, crisis debt crises in pretty well every developing country that followed uh, import substitution strategy. Right? But I'm going to leave that for next week. But the Asian tigers, um, they switched to they switched their strategy in the early 1960s away from import substitution and to a strategy known as export oriented industrialization. So X, so I, if you ever see that around. They kept their currencies undervalued rather than overvalued, right? So that their exports would have an advantage. And they only subsidized companies that were exporting, right? Uh, so incomes generated by export were often uh, tax free or taxed at a much lower rate. and all the same subsidies and tax breaks and cheap loans and um, uh, and you know free land and stuff. All the same uh, um, government handouts happened uh, to these as to uh, what was happening in the import substitution countries, but it was only for companies that were exporting. So this meant that. The quality had to be internationally competitive, right? Um, because uh, you're competing on an international market, right? Like, 
no matter how no matter how cheap something is i'm not going to buy it if it's going to fall apart or not going to work or whatever right um so it had to be internationally competitive even though they had uh, lower profit margins or bigger profit margins because they had all these subsidies and things like that or you know um uh so this actually meant that the incentives were all pushing companies to improve rather than hide behind tariff barriers and stagnate. And so they, they saw amazing results, right? Highest growth rates ever seen. Uh, though South Korea does come unstuck a little with the Asian financial crisis uh, in 1997. But again, that's a story for next week. So, that is a very quick coverage of the, the really the period between 1945 and 1971. We'll pick up from 1971 onwards uh, next week. Um, and it really was boom times for pretty well every country. Not every person, right? You didn't want to be a farmer. <laughs> um, you were getting crushed. But, uh, but every, every economy was booming, right? And um, uh, both Soviet uh, or Bretton Woods or, or um, the import substitution uh, and especially the export substitution um, countries, uh, it really was a, a, a boom time. But uh, next lecture, we'll see how it all fell apart again. <laughs> um, so, right, I'll leave it there. I hope you found that interesting. Uh, I'll talk to you on the forums and I'll uh, talk to you next lecture.